You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident fanalist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data. Well, it's pretty clear to me now the entire Packers organization not only listens to the podcast daily, but they're pretty big fans because when they heard that I wasn't going to be doing a podcast today, and I wasn't, I was all set and ready to go to do some other stuff. Look at this, dance party's going. Man, we're off and running today. But they decided we can't have this. We got to hire somebody. And they said, who? I said, I don't care. Anybody. Just go hire somebody. Because we need this man to keep bringing it. So we're doing a podcast today. We're probably doing one tomorrow. I don't know how long this is going to go on, but obviously this is going to take some time. And with this is going to come coordinators and we got to do some other stuff. So I don't know. We'll see what happens, I guess. But this has certainly changed the equation and it's set things back a little bit. But I'm feeling good. I'm feeling pretty excited. I'm 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 uh I'm pretty jacked. And if you're confused, I understand because there were two people that I was down on pretty much all year and that was DeFilippo and Matt LaFleur. However, if you're that loyal of a listener and you remember me being down on him, you probably remember me more recently starting to come around. It was, I don't know, we'll call it a week ago when I started digging a little bit deeper and I, I thought, you know, well, I don't want to give away exactly what I'm saying today. But I, as I was poking around with uh, Mr. Patriots guy that's going to be going back to the Patriots because he's a bum and I can't wait to beat him in the Super Bowl, I noticed a couple things and it kind of made me realize, you know, maybe, just maybe, LaFleur isn't exactly the problem in Tennessee. Now, that doesn't necessarily make him great when things aren't going well in Tennessee, but my entire objection maybe needs to be put on pause with him. Then, as recent as yesterday, I started talking about maybe what we really need to focus on is a West Coast offense type of guy. And I said, most people are West Coast. Josh McDaniels is not, but I really do think we need to keep it in a West Coast style offense. And I'm not sure if I did, but I know LaFleur was one of the guys that I was was referencing when I said West Coast offense because he does run a West Coast offense. I know we think of it as a very different scheme, is and it is, but it's still a West Coast offense, and I think that's important because I don't exactly want to try to teach an old dog new tricks, so to speak. Maybe that's the wrong way to put it because he is going to learn a few new tricks. But again, you know, again, I don't want to rehash the whole thing, but all the terminology and all this different stuff, I, I just I don't want to redo all that. And, and beyond that, it doesn't usually work very well. Usually when we switch, and this is what I've noticed as I've done this little search, if we switch from, I don't know, the Patriots schlip and schlam and shim and scheme, I will never remember the name of that because why would you name it that? Earhart Perkins. Stop being so conceited. Give it a cool name. West Coast. Spread. Air Coriel. I mean, Coriel is somebody's last name, but still, you got air in there. Call it the Slam Perkins or something. I don't know. The Earhart Assault. Whatever. Make it something cool. Earhart Perkins. And you even got a little... Whatever. It's dumb. And it doesn't work anywhere anyways. Works with the Patriots. Doesn't work anywhere else. All right, fine, Texans. I don't care. I'm bitter. I don't have to like Josh McDaniels anymore in their dumb system. But I think the biggest thing is if we hired Josh McDaniels, the thing that I would be saying on this podcast is I like it for several reasons, but I think we should expect at least a year. And that was what I was talking about is is part of my problem is we don't have a year to just kill. And beyond that, you got... You know, how bad are things going to devolve in a year with the fan base, with Aaron Rodgers, with the team, with the locker room? It's already been two bad years in a row. We want another third year, but we're just going to say to the team, don't worry, guys, it takes a year to get used to this system. And then, hey, 2020, right? We're coming out firing. So so we narrow it down to West Coast offense, and then once you do that, the names really do get pretty slim, and it, it's a slim year. 
And this is one of the perks of firing Mike McCarthy so early is you get a head start because there aren't that many guys that are really, really potentially awesome candidates. There's a ton of retreads, and there's a ton of issues elsewhere. I don't know if you listened to Locked On. Uh, he illuminated yesterday some of the issues with enemy and, you know, uh, domestic assault or assault. or I, I don't know. I didn't look into it myself, but he's got a long track record of some pretty shady stuff. I give people credit when they say stuff, see? But I didn't know that, and that's that's one of those things where you take him off the list. Okay, now what? If we want our shot at a Matt Nagy or a Sean McVay or a Kyle Shanahan, it really is, it's it's kind of Matt LaFleur or bust. I mean, you, you could say Zach Taylor, maybe, but Zach Taylor is just a less sure version of, of Matt LaFleur. Now, let, let, let's really quick cover my objection to LaFleur, and that was, it was a pretty simple equation, and you got to understand, when I did this at first, remember, I did a list of about, I think it was like 52 coaches, so I can't go super in-depth, all right? I didn't look at every single aspect. I had a, a criteria, and essentially what I looked at is, okay, so here are his successes, but there's a lot of different people involved in those successes, so what happens when you remove him from an environment, right? I, I, I want to try to zero in, kind of triangulate on this particular coach. So when you remove all these other pieces that we know are successful, Kyle Shanahan is very successful. He doesn't have Kyle Shanahan anymore. Sean McVay, very successful. He doesn't have Sean McVay. He goes to an entire new group of people, an entire new team. What happens when he's just handed the team and the play calling duties? He was offensive coordinator for the Rams, but I'm pretty sure McVay is calling the plays. Now he has control of an offense. What happens? The team was terrible. Terrible. So I just looked at that and said, okay, so why would I like him? What, what, that, doesn't that kind of explain things? I know there are other variables at play, and I, I know the, the Titans don't have the talent, but if this is a great offensive coordinator, why would they go backwards? They should at least stagnate. They went backwards from 2017 to 2018. That's horrible. Well, if you've been listening to some of the other people out there, they've highlighted quite a bit about the injuries. You know, uh, Marcus Mariota, who's somewhat mediocre to begin with, was has been struggling through injury all year. You know, Delaney Walker, who was arguably his, his number one target, IR. I think he went out week one. Uh, Jack Conklin, uh, their tackle. He ended the season. I think he started the season hurt, ended the season on IR. I mean, it's, it's, it's not horrible compared to a lot of other teams, but it's just, you know, th- there's been injuries. But... Here's the thing that I'm, I'm a little bit more focused on. First of all, I want to point something out. This was, according to Pro Football Focus, Marcus Mariota's best year. It's not that much better than last year. It was almost identical, but it was still better. Marcus Mariota, with an injury, didn't regress. He actually got a little bit better. Um, as far as his completion percentage, this was his, his best year. In 2015, 62.2, 61.2, just going in order here. Uh, 62.0 this year, 68.9. So 62, 61, 62. This year with Lafleur, 69. That's pretty impressive. Now yardage, complete trash. 2,528. Now part of that is him only playing 14 games, which still doesn't average out very high. But he's never really had a lot. He had 2,815. Uh, 2015, he had 34, then 32, then 25. Um, you know, part of that has to do with how much they run the ball, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but it's not super great. Uh, interceptions on the season, only eight. That was his lowest ever. So going in order from 2015, 10, 9, 15, 8. Uh, as a percentage, it was his second lowest, which I guess makes, you know, it's a little more accurate. But still a good a- good year for that. If you look at his yards per attempt, 7.6, which is actually exactly consistent with uh, three of his last four years have been 7.6. You want to know something else, though, that, that really stands out, and this is something I noticed when I started watching more Titans games, which I'm going to be doing more of. Look at sack percentage. Percentage of, of times when he was sacked trying to throw a pass. Last year, 5.6%. This year, 11.3%. He just got wrecked this year. The offensive line was trash. They, they had very little ability to run the ball. Every time I saw him try to run the ball, they couldn't go anywhere. And Mariota was always running for I mentioned that. I mentioned that recently. I went back and watched some Titans games because I wanted to see LaFleur and I wanted to see his system. I I, I talked about it on the podcast. I, I said, uh, you know, I, I wanted to get a better look at LaFleur to see was, was there something wrong with the scheme or was it the team? 
And I said, I, I, I didn't see anything wrong. When, when the play was executed, everything seemed fine. But when they try to run the ball, there's nowhere to go. Occasionally, Mariota would miss passes. Otherwise, he's running for his life. He's getting sacked. So things in that regard were just not very good. So that's taken a little bit of the pressure off of Lafleur, which is what I said in that episode. Here is sort of the biggest thing, and I think I already said this, but I'm going to say it again. Marcus Mariota, for his entire career, played in the Earhart Perkins system. That, um, that's the New England Patriots system. So that's all Mariota's known. It's maybe also why the Titans' offense has never really been that good. This year, Lafleur comes in and he says, we're going to run a West Coast system. Well, like I've said, anytime you try to switch, you know, you can switch offensive coordinators and change up the terminology a little bit and this and that and the other, but this is an entire different, the, the vernacular is different, the, the philosophy is different, everything is different, everything you've been coached to do. I mean, just things like, you know, reading high to low as opposed to low to high, or, or you know, Earhart Perkins is, is deliberately looking for the, the low guy. Right, you're you're looking for that guy who ran the curl run, as opposed to maybe in the West Coast, you're you're reading, well, you know, Air Coriel, for example, you're looking deep first and then working your way down. So everything just gets flipped on its head. So in a year where your quarterback's hurt, you've got this entirely new offensive scheme to try to learn. Delaney Walker, your number one relief valve, when you're not a very good quarterback, you need a relief valve, and you don't have very good wide receivers. He's gone, been gone since week one. You can't run the ball effectively. Because your offensive line just apparently isn't very good. And your running backs aren't all that great to begin with. I mean, everything I saw was sort of like, you know, close your eyes and go. So the more I looked at it, and I'm glad I did, because otherwise I'd have just been not very happy right now. Although, here's the other thing. The other thing that I had said is that I do have a lot of trust and faith in Mark Murphy and Brian Gutekunst. I felt Mark Murphy did a fantastic job getting Brian Gutekunst. I liked his philosophy. You know, I've, I've talked about it several times where he just said, I want to know in the draft, I want to see the reports that you had about guys in the past. I mean, it, it's a very simplistic thing, and I'm sure there's a lot more to the interview than just that, but that was the thing. If you ask him, what was, what, what, what was it about Gutekunst? He says, that's what it was. I told them, I want to see all your reports. They all came in. They laid it out. He read through it. He looked at Brian Gutekunst's reports, and he said, oh my goodness, this guy gets it. This guy can draft. All right, this is this is the guy who, you know, he nailed it on Kenny Clark. You know, his write-up on, I'm making this up, obviously, I don't know, but you look back at Demarius Randall and see what he said, and he says he's not going to be a very good this, that, or the other. I don't know. But he was, he was very dead accurate on these things. And because we prioritize the draft in Green Bay, like most teams do, but that's a big piece of it, he looked at that and said that's going to be the number one piece, and when he saw Brian Gutekunst, he pulled the trigger. So what, what I have also said is I will have faith because they know much more than I know. And the fact that, I mean, he, he interviewed for the job one day before he got the job. And he wasn't even necessarily first on the list. So he interviewed on Sunday. On Monday, they said, we want to hire you. And um, Lafleur said yes. I mean, the, everything about this, I just, I'm, I'm really starting to fall in love with. I mean, absolutely everything. It, it, the Packers like him, I like him for one. It's West Coast, which I think is very, very important. And then Lafleur's pedigree, which we're going to go back over again, and I want to go even more in-depth at a later time. But just, just to do it again, because I've done it before, it is, other than the Titans, obviously very, very impressive. And then I want to try to look a little bit into his philosophy, although I don't know much yet. That's part of what I'm going to be doing some research on and probably talking about tomorrow, because there is going to be a podcast tomorrow. Just really trying to do a deep dive. I was trying to do it a little bit yesterday, just kind of on the fly. You know, it's I do the podcast in the morning because in the afternoon I don't want it to interfere with you know family time and whatnot. So it's not like I saw the news and I I, mean, I did. I ran downstairs and started watching Titan stuff and everything else. But it was about thirty seconds went by and it was like you need to come back up here. We got stuff to do. It's like all right, fine, I know. But um, I'm going to be doing a little bit more of that today. But anywho, before we uh, continue our deep dive, allow me to do my. It's not even a preliminary when you're 15 minutes in. But patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy if you'd like to support the podcast. There's also a link to a one-time donation in the description if you'd like to go that route. Anything and everything is appreciated. You can go as little as a buck a month. It'll help to offset some of the cost. I really, really appreciate all the people that are doing that. It's been uh, it's been awesome. Kind of blows me away a little bit. 
Packernet.com for all your news, notes, and information. Definitely going to want to check that out today. There's going to be a lot of news going on with the uh, the Green Bay Packers. Make sure you don't miss any of it. Head over to Packernet.com. We've got all the latest articles and news up there for you. Also, video, audio, the whole shebang shabop. If you'd like to call in or text a question, 608-501-0718. 608-501-0718. Just leave a message at the beep or shoot me a text if you have any specific questions about Lafleur or this, that, or the other. I don't care. It could be about whatever you want. I've got a little bit of a backlog of questions. I'm sorry I haven't gotten to yet. Going to get there, but obviously Lafleur takes the floor. <laughs> oh, man. Burned him. Be sure to get in the Facebook group. Otherwise, what else? NFLBigBoard.com. I think that's it. I know everybody's taking a break from the draft temporarily. I did not get to watch the uh, the championship, the college football championship, where Clemson stomped out Alabama, which is up f- pretty unfortunate because quite a few people that are going to be in the draft were in that game. But, um, you know, whatever. That's all right. But if you still want to check it out, be sure to do so. In fact, I'm going to be looking at a few different people now that I know who our offensive coordinator is just to get an idea. And, it, man, that's going to be kind of an interesting thing to talk about, too, is, you know, how much does Brian Gutekunst want to interact with LaFleur, which I would hope is a lot, but again, it's one of those weird things where it seems like there's a separation of power where the GM's just kind of like, I'm going to do what I do, and you just don't worry about it. Just run my team. I hope that's not the case. I really hope Brian Gutekunst is going to interact with Matt LaFleur and say, you know, this is kind of how I run my offense. This is kind of what I need. This is what we base it on. And then, you know, Brian Gutekunst kind of takes that information and goes out and finds it. That's what I always thought happened, but it comes come to find out that's not exactly how it works. But, um, yeah, hopefully that's a little bit more of the case this time around because Lafleur runs it a little different. And I think there's a couple pieces that are already needs, but maybe if we add it, it'll help even more so because Lafleur is going to utilize these particular positions a little bit more so. But anyways, let's take a quick trip through Matt LaFleur land. So he started off his career at Saginaw Valley State, which is a Division II school. He was an offensive assistant there. I believe he, that's where he played quarterback also, which is probably how he ended up getting a job there. He moves on to Central Michigan, which is an FBS school, so it was a step up. Offensive assistant there as well, does that for a couple years. Goes to Northern Michigan, uh, which is a D2 school but as a quarterback's wide receiver coach. So it's kind of a, you know, you take a step back, but then you get more responsibility. It's, it's just one of those things you do, I guess. Moves on to Ashland, another D2 school, but as an offensive coordinator. So he's kind of working the Michigan circuit a little bit, trying to get his pedigree up a little bit. From there, somehow, <laughs> he gets noticed. The Houston Texans pick him up as a quality control coach. Now that's pretty low on the totem pole, but that's pretty impressive to be a D2 offensive coordinator to uh, make a jump into the NFL. But, you know, he goes all the way to the bottom, does that for two years, and then he jumps up from quality control. I mean, listen, this is another thing you really like to see is quick risers, right? Sean McVay, all these kinds of guys, these kinds of jumps just don't even make sense. I mean, he's playing around in D2, but even so, he, he goes from offensive assistant to next year quarterbacks coach, to next year offensive coordinator, to next year quality control coach for the Texans, two years later quarterback coach for the Washington Redskins. He's 31 years old. Three years ago, he's the offensive coordinator for a D2 school. (laughs) That's what in the world. So he does that for four years, then he's a quarterbacks coach for Notre Dame, goes to the FBS level. I don't know if the plan was to kind of try to take a step back, see if he can move up, and then et cetera, et cetera. But then the Atlanta Falcons call, say, we want you to be our quarterback's coach. So he's like, all right, fine, I guess we'll just go that route. Does that for a couple of years, and then he kind of catches a break because he's been lingering, right? He's a fast riser, but he's been a quarterback coach from 2010 now to 2016. He hasn't been able to do that big jump. Well, then the L.A. Rams hire Sean McVay. Sean McVay, um, he had worked with... Matt LaFleur with the Washington Redskins. They both came on in 2010. So you had McVay coming on, assistant tight ends coach, and um, Matt LaFleur going into Washington as the quarterback's coach. Who was the head coach for the Washington Redskins at the time? Mike Shanahan. So Mike Shanahan comes in in 2010. He hires a whole new staff. And props to Mr. Mike Shanahan for hiring a just a, a batch of unbelievably talented people, 
Also on that staff, by the way, his son Kyle Shanahan in 2010. So in 2010, Mike Shanahan brings in Kyle Shanahan to be his offensive coordinator. He brings in a young, fast-rising Matt LaFleur to be his quarterback's coach. Guy just, I mean, what does he know about him? That's incredible. And he brings on Sean McVay to be a assistant tight ends coach. McVay had done almost nothing. I mean, where, how do you even gather this kind of information? He obviously wanted a very young, fast-rising group. He was 24 years old when he hired him as assistant tight ends coach. And maybe, you know what, maybe it could have been that he hired his son, and his son went on and, and kind of did a lot of this groundwork. I don't know. But McVay, prior to this hire, was a wide receivers coach for the Florida Tuskers, a UFL coach, or a, a UFL team, when he was 23. The year before that, he was 22 years old and was an assistant wide receivers coach for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. What did he do prior to that? I don't know. Hanging out at a frat party? I, I, I don't know. Nothing. Nothing is the answer. So just a really kind of unusual but awesome little team they assembled there. Especially now looking ahead. I mean, you got LaFleur, who's now the head coach of the Green Bay Packers. You got McVay, who is this stud in um, in Los Angeles. And then you've got, uh, obviously, Kyle Shanahan in San Francisco. I mean, this is this is the group. And I think that's part of it for the Packers. They want a piece of it. And this is, I don't want to say it's the last piece, but of that group in 2010 for the Washington Redskins, that young ascending group, I, as far as I know, that's it. They're all West Coast guys that learned under Mike Shanahan. That's where they got their start. Now, Matt LaFleur, his first job was to coach Donovan McNabb. Now, this is 31-year-old LaFleur, who's, you know, again, basically a T- D2 coach who was a quality control guy for the Houston Texans at 31 years old who is now coming in to coach 34-year-old Donovan McNabb, who has been a quarterback since 1999. In 2011, they hand over the keys to Rex Grossman. He was there last year as well. For three of those games, it was also John Beck, but Rex Grossman was the guy, which I feel sorry for uh, Lafleur for having to be his coach. Obviously, we know who Rex Grossman is and what he's capable of, and the answer is not very much. 57.9 completion percentage, 3,100 yards, 16 touchdowns. (laughs) 20 interceptions. Oh, seriously? 20 interceptions? Wow. That's pretty incredible. The very next year, he gets his third quarterback now, and this is Robert Griffin III. Now, remember, when he came out, he came out hot. And that's something that's pretty impressive is what he's done with quarterbacks. Now, I know Donovan... It wasn't a great year, but this guy's already, I mean, this was his second to last year playing in the NFL. It was his first year with the Redskins, his last year with the Redskins. Rex Grossman steps up. He's not good because he's Rex Grossman. Now Robert Griffin comes in, very young, very athletic, very talented, and also very, I mean, he's he's new. He's not like an older guy looking down on everybody else. He's he's coming in like, okay, teach me stuff. And this is also the third year for LaFleur to know the Mike Shanahan team, the Kyle Shanahan offense to understand how to be a coach, right? He's kind of getting into his groove a little bit. He comes out of the gate firing, playing 15 games, uh, 65.6 completion percentage, 3,200 yards, which, you know, isn't a lot. 20 touchdowns, 5 interceptions, 102.4 quarterback rating, and pro football focus had him graded as the fourth best quarterback in the NFL, if you can believe that, as a passer. His passing grade was fourth best. So this isn't like, yeah, he was good because he ran around. No, 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 no. Fourth best passing grade. His run grade wasn't even very good. As a matter of fact, it dragged him down. His overall grade, he was eighth. But as a passer, fourth. The only guys that were better better than him that year, third, Tom Brady, second, Aaron Rodgers, number one, Peyton Manning. That's how good he was coming out of the gate. Then in uh, 2013, everything just kind of fell apart. RG3 wasn't exactly RG3. And you got to remember, this is... You know, RG3 was incredible in his rookie year. They went to the playoffs, and he jacked up. That's when he really, really messed up his knee. That was in the playoffs, January 6, 2013, against the Seahawks. So when he came back, he was just never the same. That's that's sort of the history of RG3. It's just something changed. So the team ends up winning three games the entire... So they go from the playoffs to a three-win team. Everybody gets fired. Mike Shanahan, Kyle Shanahan, LaFleur, the whole gang, they get fired. That's when uh, Jay Gruden comes in, f- hires his own staff. He leaves Sean McVay on as the offensive coordinator, which obviously speaks highly of Sean McVay, but everybody else is out. From there, he gets hired by Brian Kelly, the Notre Dame coach, currently the Notre Dame coach as well. 
the quarterback coach for Everett Golson. That was, for anybody interested, Golson's best year. He played 2012 for Notre Dame, 2015 for Florida State, but 2014 was his best year. I guess arguably best year. I don't know. It depends what you want to look at. What does it matter? The guy's not even in the NFL anyways. He It was in his college. But anyways, then he gets hired back into the NFL, this time for the Atlanta Falcons. So at this point, there is just been a little bit of a glimmer, right? I think the real first flash, first of all, is the fact that he gets hired by the Redskins, but that could be one of those things where it's like, you know, he's a quick riser, but you got Mike Shanahan, Kyle Shanahan, they're bringing in a bunch of young guys, including Kyle, you know, it's, it's kind of like he hired Kyle and his friends is what it kind of looks like. But then you see RG3 in year one really flash, and it's like, oh, that's, that's interesting. Who's this quarterback coach? Oh, okay. I'm guessing that's when his name first kind of flared up. But then RG3 falls off, he gets fired, and it, you know, his name kind of kind of goes back in the tank. Well, what happens then is Mr. Kyle Shanahan, the guy that uh, LeFleur has worked under for quite some time, he went on to be the Cleveland offensive coordinator in 2014 when LeFleur went back to Notre Dame. 2015, because Cleveland just fires everybody because their team is trash all the time, Kyle Shanahan gets hired as the offensive coordinator for the Atlanta Falcons. He brings on Matt LaFleur once again to be the quarterback coach for the Atlanta Falcons. And that, I, I think in, in that blah, blah, that really says something, right? He, he didn't have to bring him back on. If things weren't working, if he didn't like him, if he's not a good coach, he goes to Atlanta, he gets hired, he finds somebody else. He's worked with a lot of people. He knows a lot of people. His dad has a massive amount of connections. I mean, there's there's no reason he has to reach back out to Matt LaFleur, but he does. Let's take a look, see how it works out, even though I'm sure we all already know. First of all, in 2014, prior to this new takeover with Dan Quinn as the head coach, and remember, Dan Quinn is a defensive guy. He was from the Seattle Seahawks. He was sort of the guy that was the Legion of Boom guy, so that's why he got hired. He's going to fix this defense, but he needs an offensive guy. He goes out and gets Kyle Shanahan, and then Kyle Shanahan brings on LaFleur. That's how that all happened. So if, if we go back, just to remember how bad that it got for the Atlanta Falcons, 2013, they were 4-12, 2014, 6-10. The new regime comes on in 2015, they go 8-8. Eight and eight. Matt Ryan kind of just I guess we could say flat lines. He doesn't really look any different. You know, he threw for 4,500 yards, which is a lot for, you know, LaFleur's not used to that. He's used to 2,000, 3,000 kind of yards. But this is a different kind of quarterback and a different kind of team. But 4,500 yards for Matt Ryan isn't all that impressive. That's kind of par for the course. 21 touchdowns is actually very low. 16 interceptions is relatively high. So it's it's not super great in 2015. 2016, year two, under LaFleur, under Quinn, under Shanahan. And also, let me just remind you of something. As I said, when you switch from one scheme to a new scheme, things take about a year to get fixed up. 2014, what was the offensive system under Mike Smith and the Atlanta Falcons? It was Air Coriel. 2015, Kyle Shanahan runs a what? West Coast. It took a year. So what happened after that one year? In 2016, after learning, uh, learning West Coast for a year, he's got one year under his belt. First of all, he was selected to the Pro Bowl, which is the fourth time and the last time. Fourth time in his career. He hasn't been selected since. But it was also the first time ever and only time in his career he was first team All-Pro. The team went 11-5. and five. His completion percentage was 69.9, which did not lead the NFL, but it was the, the highest completion percentage he's ever had in his career. He threw for 4,944 yards, which is uh, it's the, the most he's thrown for in his career. 2018, he's having a really good year. It's pretty close, right? 69.4 completion percentage, 4,924 yards. So he's 20 yards off, but guess what? Still wasn't the 2016 team. He threw for 38 touchdowns, most in his entire career. His touchdown percentage, 7.1. His second highest touchdown percentage of his entire career was 2018, 5.8. His average for his career is 4.8. It was 7.1% in 2016. He threw seven interceptions, which is the lowest of his career, tying 2018. He led the NFL in yards per attempt at 9.3. He led the NFL in average yards per attempt at 10.1. He led the NFL in yards per catch at 13.3. He led the NFL in quarterback rating at 117.1, in quarterback rating at 79.4. He led the NFL in net yards per attempt at 8.25. He led the NFL in average yards Average net yards per attempt passing at 9.03. And then also, if you look at Pro Football Focus, they have what's called the approximate value, which is they try to put a value on a player 
and he led he was he was number one according to uh to them so easily he was you know statistically he was probably the best quarterback in 2016 he was great again first team all pro only time in his entire career so it, it was unbelievable he had the best year he's ever had in 2016 and we know Matt Ryan has had some very good years with the Atlanta Falcons you also might remember the Atlanta that that was the year that Green Bay lost to the Atlanta Falcons in the playoffs. Do you remember playing them and just thinking, I've never seen an offense like this? I mean, it, it literally was the most dominant offense I, I maybe have ever seen. That was Kyle Shanahan and Matt LaFleur. That was their offense. Something else to note here, this is not an air raid system. This is not the Green Bay Packers where it's just drop back and throw, drop back and throw, drop back and throw. The 2016 Atlanta Falcons were 26th in passing attempts. They were 12th in rushing attempts. Let me say that again. 26th in passing attempts, 12th in rushing attempts. They they threw the ball less than almost any team in the NFL. There were only, what, six teams that threw the ball less than the Atlanta Falcons in 2016? That's really impressive, and that's going to be a trend that we're going to see with with LeFleur. You look at it, and you look at the success of the quarterbacks, and you go, yeah, well, it's easy to be successful when you throw all the time, like Aaron Rodgers does. He doesn't throw all the time. He throws very few times. He runs a lot. Kyle Shanahan runs the ball a lot. All right, remember, we, we talked about Kyle Shanahan. Remember we talked about how Kyle Shanahan and how he used to practice running the ball and how they used to, you know, actually practice it. Like, they would run and drill running and running and running and how important it was and and how good the San Francisco 49ers are running the ball. Who was the guy he talked with? I think it was Ryan Grant. Ryan Grant was on, uh, man, I'm out of time. I I, I can't, I'm blanking on his name. Aaron Nagler, he talked with him. And he talked about how Kyle Shanahan would drill running and how important it was and they would practice it over and over. And he said in Green Bay with Mike McCarthy, they didn't practice running the football. Like that, that just wasn't a part of it. It was, it was all about passing. That's all that mattered to this team was passing. And I remember saying, I wonder what it would be like. Can you imagine Aaron Jones if he played for Kyle Shanahan? Guess what, ladies and gentlemen? He basically is going to. The Green Bay Packers are going to run the ball a lot. Probably more than we like. But, but please understand, as I'm trying to illustrate to you, that doesn't mean Aaron Rodgers' stats are going to go in the tank. Matt Matt Ryan went from an Air Coriel system, which is all about throw it and throw it deep, to a West Coast system under under Kyle Shanahan in which they stress the run more so than most teams, 12th in running the ball, 26th in passing. But he had his best year statistically, including yardage, including touchdowns. Running the ball and doing it well doesn't mean you can't throw the ball. We've been lied to, ladies and gentlemen. We've been lied to. We thought you had to just throw the ball all the time and only practice throwing the ball and be number one in passing every single year. That's how you get Aaron Rodgers. You you never take the ball out of Rodgers' hand. You never do it. If you're going to run it, you do it twice in the game, and that's it, to keep him honest. you got to let him know. You know. You never know when it's coming. The Green Bay Packers were 32nd in rushing. I don't want to skip ahead, but as I said, I'm out of time. Let me fast forward a bit. Let's finish it. Los Angeles Rams, he goes there. What happens to the Rams? They break out. The Rams have been trash forever, but they brought in the Kyle Shanahan offense. They brought in the more, you know, they they brought in this creative, a lot of motion, a lot of bunches, a lot of all this different stuff, but it's still the Kyle Shanahan offense. How do I know Sean McVay's running that? First of all, aside from the fact that it looks like it, guess, guess what their offense looked like in 2017 as far as running and passing. 24th in passing, 9th in rushing. See, we look at it as this high-flying passing offense. It's not. It's not. Now, they still run more. I mean, 518 passing attempts, 454 rushing attempts, but it's going to be closer to 50-50, and that's just not really very common in the NFL anymore, except with Kyle Shanahan, Sean McVay, the Titans last year, which let's let's fast forward to that. So now you've got uh, LaFleur, yeah, I know, I know, dance party, I know, DJ Galaxy, I'm going, I'm going. They, so the Green Bay Packers were 32nd in rushing attempts. Just didn't do it. Just like, no, nope, I don't care, we're not running it. It's like, yeah, but you, you got a pretty good running back. Maybe you just, maybe you try it sometimes. Nah, never. The Titans were 31st in passing attempts, 9th in rushing. They passed the ball 
less than they ran the ball. 437 passing attempts, 454 rushing attempts. I don't think that's what it's going to look like. Again, we got to remember that this is going to be tailored to the Green Bay Packers offense. The reason you had that in Tennessee is because their quarterback was hurt and not very good, and their wide receivers aren't very good, and their best passing weapon is on IR, and they've got a decent offensive line and a decent, you know, I mean, they got like a powerful offensive line and a powerful running back, so we're probably going to stress that a little bit more. But understand, it's going to be a lot more running than we're used to. And beyond that, it's going to be a more, how do I say it? It's possible that the offensive line is just going to be better. Now, I don't know what that means as far as pass blocking, but as far as run blocking, just because, again, we're practicing it. right? Why are the Packers always terrible at run blocking? Because they don't practice it. Why are they so good at pass blocking? Because all they do in practice is pass the ball. If I had more time, I'd go find the clip. Maybe I'll do it tomorrow of, of what... Uh, was said with Aaron Nagler that one time. But just go find it. So anyways, as far as fantasy football is concerned, expect the Packers to run the ball more. But beyond that, also expect them to be better. Expect the running, the run blocking to improve. And that's sort of the other thing. I'm going to end on this because i got to get going. I know it's a short episode, but I I started very late. Sorry, my bad. But if if I'm Gutekunst and I want to tailor a team to Shanahan, one of the things I'm going to be focused on is offensive line. Because it, it is a more, I mean, listen, it seems more, you know, foofy, right? You know, they got all the motion and all this. It's like trickery. We think of it as like trick plays. It's not really trick plays. They, they simpl- I don't even want to say simplify. They take the pressure off the wide receivers and use scheme a little bit more. So it's not just you have to win. It's just they set it up so that somebody should be open. But in, in reality, Kyle Shanahan and Sean McVay and... um and Lafleur, I think one of the most underrated qualities of these guys is what they do for the run game. The uh, the the highest graded player on this team was Derrick Henry for the Titans. Derrick Henry last year was in the good category. He was borderline elite this year. You look at Todd Gurley. Todd Gurley in 2015 and 2016 really wasn't very good. In 2017, under Kyle Shanahan, especially. As the offensive coordinator, he had his best year in 2017. Now, he's still better in 2018, but he, he regressed a little bit. I'm not saying Sean McVay is, you know, Kyle Shanahan, or I'm sorry, Lafleur. Lafleur is who we're talking about. Kyle Shanahan is not our coach. Lafleur is our coach. With Lafleur as their offensive coordinator in 2017, Todd Gurley had his best year. They stressed the run more. In 2016, he was below average. Gurley was below average in 2016. He was very good. So just, just I'm just going to give you the numbers. 2016, 57.3. 60 is average. 2017, 82.6. And you know what? As a receiver is where he really made his money. He was a very good receiver in 2017. 2018, 78.8. Not quite as good as 2017, but a heck of a lot better than 57.3. You look at the emergence of a guy like Matt Breida. I mean, he, he's not even the guy. He just kind of came out of nowhere. 2017 was his only other year. He was average. He went from 63.9 to 76.1. The big thing for him, receiver. He was an abysmal receiver in 2017. He was an elite receiver in 2018. Raheem Mostert, no idea who he is. Let me just run through his numbers since 2015. 58.1, 65.5, 35.9, 2018, 73.0. What happened? The 49ers just stress running. It's not about these guys even getting better. It's just the, the, the run system works better. Everybody wants to talk about the passing. Don't forget about the running, man. They stress it a lot. The offensive line, the scheme, everything just makes more sense. Guys just play better. That's not even close. I don't even know who this guy is. 58, 65, 35, 73. Just better. Alfred Morris wasn't any better, but whatever. He's just kind of Alfred Morris, I guess. I don't know. He's been kind of consistent. I mean, 2012, he was elite. 2013, he was very good. Since then, he's been average or worse. But that is a very, very important key. And, and let's also not forget, you look at San Francisco and what they did for Kyle Shanahan when he came on. Who was their first-round draft pick this past year? Mike McGlinchey, right tackle. He came in, and he was right out of the gate. Not only a very good player, it was... I, I Let me just look real quick and see what's happened here. Yes, it, he's, a, he's a, a dominant run blocker. Pass blocking, eh, he's pretty average. Run blocking, though... He's very, very good at it. Nobody's a better run blocker than pass blocker in the NFL. Mike McGlinchey is. The the 
GM of the San Francisco 49ers knows Kyle Shanahan, knows what Kyle Shanahan wants and needs in the system he runs, and he understood that offensive line is going to be very important. It was a very smart pick. I liked it at the time, even not even knowing anything about Kyle Shanahan. Makes a lot of sense. Now, I'm not saying we're going to take a first-round pick because I, I don't know that that's the case. Definitely not our first first-round pick unless unless uh, Jonah Williams falls, which would be a right tackle. But otherwise, maybe with our second pick we can get a guard or something. But I do think offensive line is going to be more important. I think they're going to drill it more. I think we're going to. I know we're going to run a lot more. But I also think it's going to be more effective because we are going to to train. We are going to to drill over and over and over the running game. And then you factor in all the different wrinkles that they do. If you just watch, if you have Game Pass, go watch the Tennessee Titans and just see. It's simple things. I mean, there's just about every time they snap the ball, somebody's in motion. Just about every single time, they're in a different formation. They're in a wishbone formation. There's all these different different things every single time. And just about every time they snap the ball, somebody's in motion when they're snapping the ball. And, and when, what I love about that, and I remember when I was watching college football, I would always see teams do that in college. And when I was scouting linebackers, there was a, a, a massive difference between you watch a really good linebacker and he plays a team that just plays a, a generic, you know, I don't even want to call it West Coast, but let's just say a Packers offense. You just line up, you run a play. Those linebackers are dominant. You want to know when the linebackers were terrible? When they play teams like this where you had guys in motion at the snap because as they're snapping the ball, you don't know if it's going to be a jet sweep. If they're going to give it to the guy, he'll fake hand it to him, he'll pull it. Well, as he's handing it to the guy, you got the linebacker trying to run to the outside because he thinks it's a jet sweep. And that little stutter step to the outside, he pulls it, he throws it the opposite direction, linebacker can't get there. It's always just these little, that, it just messes with linebackers. If, if you've got, for example, the Bears with Roquan Smith, you get these guys that are super fast, you get them going really fast in the wrong direction, game over. And even things like that just in the running game, you get a guy doing that and then you just hand the ball off to the running back. Linebackers are out of position. Now you got your offensive line who can just wash him out of the play because he's not where he needs to be. He can't square up and take him on and, and shed the block and make a tackle. He's already the wrong direction. All we got to do is wall him off. Get up to the next level and just say, nope, not coming this way. We got a guy coming through. Stand back, please, sir. Little stuff like that, that, that not just helps in the passing game, but helps in the running game. So many different things. And then, you know, of course, every once in a while, they actually give it to the guy, and it is a jet sweep. So you get guys, I mean, you know, we'll, we'll see. Maybe with the speed we have in Marquez or EQ, you'll, you'll start to see those guys running those kinds of plays more often. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm beyond excited. I'm, I'm really excited to try to dive in and dig in and, and learn more about the Shanahan offense. Um, but just be prepared, man. It's going to look different. It's, they're going to be not just in crazy formations, which it was funny. I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday, and it was like, you just kind of know what the Packers are doing. Based on down and distance and formation, it's like, oh, this is what they're doing. And occasionally, it's, it's like, oh, they didn't run it there. Really thought they were going to. But it's just you just always know. But again, when you watch the Titans, it's like, I don't even know what formation that is. Then you got guys running this way, and then, you know, they'll run. The, I, just, I can't even describe it. Just there's, there's, there's a bunch of different formations. And then from those formations, they have guys going in all these different directions. Sometimes they go this way. Sometimes it's a run. Sometimes it's a pass. Sometimes they're running out in the flat. Sometimes they're staying in the block. It just, you, you never know. The last play I saw the Titans run, they had three guys in the backfield. I don't know if it was two running backs and a tight end or what. I mean, that's just, what do you even do with that? The defense has more to prepare for. It, it, it's, not, it's not even gimmicky. It's just, it's just giving the offense a little bit of, of an advantage, which is something that Aaron Rodgers and the Packers never had. It was sort of like, you line up, you pretty much know what we're going to do, but you know what, we're going to beat you anyways. Kyle Shanahan says, forget all that. Put the stress on the defense. Make them try to figure it out. We should be the ones that know the play and they don't. That gives us the advantage. Why are we Why are we leveling the playing field for them? You don't know what we're going to do. And you have to guess. And if you guess wrong, we're going to hurt you. And the thing is, what Marcus Mariota can't do, Aaron Rodgers can. The ability to make decisions with these these read option type things where you, you can hand it, you can, you can pull it and throw, you can do all these different things. His ability to read the defense and see what they're doing. Right? With all the motion, you can read what they're doing. You can, whatever. Are the, are the linebackers move those split second decisions that you need to, to be able to run this kind of an offense? Do I hand it? Do I pass it? Do I take it myself? Whatever. These things are are you need a quarterback with a high processor, and I don't I don't know there's too many people with a higher processor than Aaron Rodgers. So yes, I'm very excited. And no, I don't want to stop talking, but I have to. So 
Be excited. Be of good cheer, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, I'm very excited to see what this offense is going to look like. Um, I, I would be surprised if we don't improve. Again, I, what I've said in the past is the Packers are a better roster, and this is actually a question that I got uh, uh, via Twitter <coughs> wanting to compare us to some of the better teams, and I'm going to do that. Um, but, uh, you know, just, just looking at our roster, this is a better team than what we ended the season on. So what I've said is even if we get a head coach that's just a zero, right? McCarthy was a negative, obviously, because we played less than we should have. If we just get back to zero, I think we were a nine-win team. Not that that's all that fantastic, but if if Shanahan and this offense and the system works, we can not only be a nine-win team, we could be 10-11-win team. In other words, there's zero reason in my mind. And again, we have the draft. If we make a move, I don't know, I'm just saying, you know, Antonio Brown, whatever it happens to be, doesn't have to be A.B. Could always draft a guy, you know, if we have the opportunity to get a Hollywood Brown type uh, with our second pick. I mean, you want to, well, never mind, whatever. I, I don't think it's it's that far-fetched to say that it's entirely possible we could be a playoff team. Even, in you know, the news is we're probably keeping petting. A lot of Packer fans don't like that, but I really do think that's somewhat of a shallow view of things. What was the defense early in the season when everybody was healthy? And by the way, healthy doesn't even mean good. We didn't have edge rushers. Mike McCarthy or uh, Mike Daniels is not having a fantastic year. Outside of Jair, we did not have very good corners. I know everybody thinks Ke- Kevin King is great. He He's not very good. He hasn't been so far. Maybe he will be. He hasn't been. Josh Jackson, not very good. We have not really had any safeties. Linebackers, meh. Jake Ryan's out. Blake Martinez is decent. Oren Burks is no good. Morrison's not very good. So with very limited ability, when that defense was healthy, they were pretty decent. At the very least, we weren't getting gashed. It wasn't until the end of the year when we lost everybody. We lost Kenny Clark. We lost Mike Daniels. We lost Kevin King. We lost our, our safeties. We lost HaHa. As much as everybody thinks that was an upgrade, it wasn't. Tremont is no good as a safety. Slightly better tackler, maybe, but it just, as far as defending the pass, he's not as good. So... I'm excited. We're likely keeping Mike Pettin. I'm very excited to explore some options as far as offensive coordinator to be able to look at the, at, into these guys, learn more about this offensive system. Oh, very happy, very happy. But anyways, I got to go. You folks enjoy your Tuesday. It is the worst day of the week, but I feel like today will be a little bit of a better one. Have a great day. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.